Disarmament is impossible without international security. We will not halt the arms race by pretending we will just throw arms away, for we cannot agree on parity. We can only be effective if we focus on a positive concept. International security is a positive concept. Ambassador Rosides felt at home with President Kennedy, saying he was of like mind and knew that he was moving swiftly against hardliners toward nuclear disarmament and true security. Kennedy requested to meet again. The ambassador remained heartbroken, recalling his great encouragement, adding his brother Robert would have picked up the torch. If our greatest obstacle is distrust, distrust can change with small human efforts. The sense of justice is inherent in the spirit of man. It is not the power of weapons, but the power of this spirit that can save the world. Welded together in what should be a continued cooperation for world peace, all those who had fought against oppression, by all who have sacrificed themselves. Ladies and gentlemen, we meet here in an hour of grief and challenge. Dag Hammarskjöld is dead. His tragedy is deep in our hearts, but the tasks for which he died are at the top of our agenda. A noble servant of peace is gone, but the quest for peace lies before us. The nuclear weapon issue was an albatross for him. Dag focused on what he could do, a lifetime protecting not only superpowers from themselves, but all the smaller, newly emerging countries. Control over the uranium for our weapons remained dirty business. Not only untold thousands die from handling it, but anyone getting in the way of its use is eliminated. Where is the best source of the uranium used in these bombs? The purest source used for Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the West's vast nuclear arsenal. The mining company, along with its customers, do not wish any interference to their highly profitable, secretive, deadly resource. The new democratically elected Congo, with its brave Irish peacekeepers, was threatened with uprisings. Dag Hammarskjöld was again personally going to help face and mediate. Mediation or compromise was obviously not welcomed by the powers that be, and the general secretary and his colleagues were murdered just miles from their destination and these uranium mines. Unconditional war can no longer lead to unconditional victory. It can no longer serve to settle disputes. It can no longer concern the great powers alone. For a nuclear disaster spread by winds and water and fear could well engulf the great and the small, the rich and the poor, the committed and the uncommitted alike. Mankind must put an end to war. So let us here resolve that Dag Hammarskjöld did not live or die in vain. Let us call a truce to terror. Let us invoke the blessings of peace. And as we build an international capacity to keep peace, let us join in dismantling the national capacity to wage war. This will require new strength and new roles, the mere existence of modern weapons, 10 million times more powerful than any that the world has ever seen, and only minutes away from any target on Earth is a source of horror and discord and distrust. Men no longer maintain that disarmament must await the settlement of all disputes. And man may no longer pretend that the quest for disarmament is a sign of weakness. For in a spiraling arms race, a nation's security may be shrinking even as its arms increase. For 15 years, this organization has sought the reduction and destruction of arms. Now that goal is no longer a dream. It is a practical matter 
of life or death. The risks inherent in disarmament pale in comparison to the risks inherent in an unlimited arms race. Recognizing that this is no longer a Soviet problem or an American problem, but a human problem. President Kennedy was among many whose hopes were assassinated by a military right. With anti-nuclear rallies banned in Greece, Dr. Gregoris Lambrakis did a one-man anti-nuclear walk from Marathon to Athens and was assassinated for it shortly after by those of the right wing. In his name, hundreds of thousands disregarded the ban and gathered to march against the weapons. If we can't know who killed Kennedy, we can see the opposing forces that killed his hope, his goals, his life vision. Specifically, his planned actions toward nuclear disarmament. The structure alone for one soft emplacement contains 129,000 tons of steel and concrete, nails and lumber. Enough concrete will have been poured to build another Hoover Dam. Enough earth will have been moved to build a levee along the entire length of the Mississippi, five feet high and ten feet wide. Enough steel to build a million automobiles. The biggest, the most involved, the most complex construction project in the history of our nation. Titan intercontinental ballistic missile deployed in underground silos that will withstand all but a direct nuclear hit. All of us who share the construction of missile site responsibility, dedicate ourselves to finishing these sites in harmony and with the greatest possible speed and economy. Why end the Kennedy's momentum for us? We know especially in JFK's last year that he was heading strongly against the winds and industry of nuclear armament. His wanting to share technologies for a joint mission to the moon and beyond contradicting those so focused on fighting enemies. He was arranging to personally go to Moscow. Every part that goes into these missiles and launchers has a life and death significance more vital than any battle line in history. I'm confident that the Commission will continue to get the cooperation of all our workers, our labor unions, and our management officials in making sure that our missile programs Go forward uninterrupted. For never before have the destinies of so many hundreds of millions of people depended on the timely activation of a weapon. Declaring our destinies depend on these weapons? How else to dedicate our trillions to buy the world's highest educated for them still depends on us believing this. Kennedy no longer believed it. How can we anymore? The total complex of this largest military construction program in history is spread across the nation in 16 states, from California and the state of Washington on the west coast to Plattsburgh Air Force Base in upstate New York. Closely coordinated, 25 major contractors employing more than 100,000 men and women, 400 subcontractors, more than 400,000 vendors and suppliers are working under the most extreme management pressures it is possible to exert to provide a gargantuan ballistic force. Unions must work with unions and crafts with crafts in ways that have never been needed before. In the interest of national security. The AFL CIO and all its departments and affiliated unions support that order without reservation. We pledge our full cooperation to assure uninterrupted work at all missile sites. We had a student protest in Washington in 1962. We had maybe 4,000 kids. I was at the, the church, which is the command center. The students had come to check with me, ask what they should do. They said that the uh, president had sent out a butler with coffee and donuts. And should they accept it? The president is really saying, I need help. When does the president ever send out coffee and donuts to a picket line? Kennedy was really trapped by the Cold War. And I, he, I think was needed this kind of, of action to help him. So I said, by all means, take the coffee and donuts. The United Nations 18th General Assembly, which opened in an unusually hopeful atmosphere, hears a message of interplanetary importance from President Kennedy. 
will rise with Ambassador Adlai Stevenson. Why pick as your ambassador a well-known champion of nuclear disarmament? Public support financing this highest ramped up nuclear missile production period required the corresponding political rhetoric and fear of the arch enemy, the communist world. Imagine sharing missile technology. On this day, he will shock and madden all military industrialists. Two months later, he'll be dead. Makes a startling proposal. Finally, in a field where the United States and the Soviet Union have a special capacity in the field of space, there is room for new cooperation, for further joint efforts, a joint expedition to the moon. Space offers no problems of sovereignty. By resolution of this assembly, the members of the United Nations have forsworn any claim to territorial rights in outer space or on celestial bodies and declare that international law and the United Nations Charter will apply. Why, therefore, should man's first flight to the moon be a matter of national competition? Why should the United States and the Soviet Union, in preparing for such expeditions, become involved in immense duplications of research, construction, and expenditure? For some, his words never existed. The Polaris submarine construction program approached completion. Recent months have been marked by numerous launchings and commissions. Can we say, mission accomplished? Become complacent with the assurance there's a mighty nuclear deterrent at work to maintain our security? The truth is, no modern weapon system can contribute to our security without a continuing expenditure of human energy to man it, to maintain it, and to modify and develop it to meet changing requirements. The job of keeping it ready, ready as an ever effective deterrent, is a story that never ends. Instead of pushing a Cold War, he was planning to meet Khrushchev again in Moscow. Instead of armament industries flooding the third world factions with weapons to resolve disputes, he knew how to prevent war and hatred by having unarmed youth learn other languages and cultures and to teach and train without the idea of profit in areas of greatest human need. These noble goals and ideas were murdered. The road to ridding ourselves of missiles is guided by steps of building genuine trust. At President Kennedy's news conference in Washington, the chief executive announces the creation of a Peace Corps to help the developing countries of the world. To help foreign countries meet their urgent needs for skilled manpower. It will not be easy. None of the men and women will be paid a salary. They will live at the same level as the citizens of the country which they're sent to, doing the same work, eating the same food, speaking the same language. We're going to put particular emphasis on those men and women who have skills in teaching, agriculture, and in health. In the last few months, more applications for the Peace Corps have come to us than have come for positions in all the rest of the United States government put together. It's not designed as a weapon of propaganda. It's not designed as a tool in the Cold War. It is a genuine effort. Young people in this country are anxious to hold out their hands to people in other worlds. They will learn as much as they will teach. I hope that from it will come renewed understanding by people all over the world of a common desire for peace. I hope out of it will come a better life for all mankind. I'm getting uh, rather suspicious over here that uh, despite your instructions that uh, some of our friends over in the Central Intelligence Agency, they're trying to stick fellas into the Peace Corps. We've got a group in training now that looks suspicious, but I sure how want those... Oh, will you call to... Dick Helms? Just say to him, you talk to me, and I don't want anybody in there. Okay. And if they are there, let's get them out now. We're very, very anxious that there be no... Uh, we don't want to discredit this whole idea. Okay, fine. And uh, they, in Christ, they're not going to find out that much intelligence. The president our military and right wing are proud of for signing off on the bomb spent his last year supporting Kennedy going to Moscow, disarmament causes, and a ban on these weapons. How are you? 
Maybe it's going to help. I do, but I'm writing you a letter, but I'm in complete agreement. Congratulations on uh, getting that thing done. I think it's a wonderful thing. Well, I appreciate that very much, uh, Mr. President. That's very generous. I'm going to the St. Louis tomorrow yeah. for the American Legion Convention. Yeah. Uh, do you think that's a good That no, I can't imagine a better. That'd be very helpful. Well, I want to do it the way you want it. I want to do whatever will be helpful to you. Thank you very much. I'll be glad to do it. The monk Thomas Merton was fiercely criticized for anti-nuclear weapon writings in his Cold War letters of 1962, which church authorities then forbade to be published. He elucidated, quote, People do not feel at all threatened by the bomb, but they feel terribly threatened by some student carrying a placard. Prophetically, Merton wrote President Kennedy that he was concerned that he could be assassinated if he continued to push back on the missile industry. Without upholding religion, we shine the light on all leaders for humanity. There were many ready to pounce on any sign of our first Irish Catholic president being influenced by a pope, especially one who was so clearly outspoken against the race of nuclear weapons and the business of militarism in general. Pope John saw it as a great weakness, not strength, hence a quiet sending of Vice President Johnson. In spring 1963, both the Pope and JFK would come out with major speeches and works against these weapons. Both would be dead within months.